turning your Bibles to Philippians. We are in a study of the book of Philippians on Sunday. We have introduced the book last time. The first two verses, the salutation. Paul is writing uh, with an expression from uh, Timothy as well, who joined Paul's team on the second missionary trip while they were in Philippi. So he mentions him while he had a great teaching ministry with them. Uh, uh, he, he taught the young converts. And so he, that's mentioned. He, he's writing to the saints in Christ Jesus or at Philippi, including the overseers, pastor teachers and ministers, and deacons. He uses the normal salutation that he does in all four prison epistles, the Ephesians, Colossians, uh, Philippians, and Philemon. He says, grace to you and peace from our God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm picking up the subject in verses 3, 4, and 5. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. I want you to notice something in the English. I want you to notice that verse 3 ends in a comma. I want you to notice that verse 4 ends in a comma, and verse 5 ends in a period. That makes that one complete thought. All right? One complete thought. That's one idea. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you in view of your participation in the gospel from the first day until now. He walked in the city, preached the gospel, people got saved. They stayed long enough to form a church, left Timothy to minister to the young converts as he moved westward, uh, as we talked about last word, uh, the Macedonian call out of Acts 16. I want, you, I want to go back to verse 4 because I've had an enormous week of ministry over verse 4 in my personal life out in your community or in my community. I thank my God in all of my remembrance of you, verse 4, always offering prayer with, with, you, with joy in my every prayer for you all. I find that really interesting. Always, I thank my God in all of my remembrance of you. You know, we, we can remember a lot of things about a lot of people. We probably don't, remember, don't want to remember all of it. <laughs> uh, we don't mind remembering a little bit of it. But all of it, when you remember all of it, it had to have been some kind of a good experience for you. Would you agree? And so Paul has had a wonderful experience with these people that he can write, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. As a result, I am always offering prayer with joy. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Do you add any joy to your prayer? I know you've been taught to add Thanksgiving, the giving of thanks. But what about joy? And where, did, where did that joy come from? It came from Paul's remembrance. Watch this. I thank my God in all my, remember, all my remembrance of you, always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. His joy is coming out of the prayer when he remembers all the little things and big things that happened while he was there with them 
in, in a fellowship. He walked in this city. They were unbelievers. They were converted through the gospel, the preaching of the gospel. Uh, he set them down and gave them Bible study, brought Timothy in to, to, to continue that Bible study and spiritual growth momentum. They uh, formed a church. They qualified men to be deacons. They qualified men through the study of spiritual gifts for ministry before Paul left town. That's pretty good. Plus, he put a guy in there, Timothy, who was teaching all the converts, which was steadily going on. They were convert con because listen, a great wave of evangelism had struck Macedonia. This is going to happen in Philippi and in Corinth, and is it's going to go through uh, two great regions. And 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 Paul is recalling all the wonderful things that came through salvation. Preaching the gospel and seeing people's life changed. I tell you, when you preach the gospel and you see uh, people's life changed by it and their excitement for God and how they're developing a prayer life and how they're making really crucial decisions in their life that are altering the way of their life. I started out to go to dentistry. I was passionate from the sixth grade all the way through high school and into college to be a dentist. That was my passion. I got saved. In the midst of that, I got saved. And my life was dramatically changed. Now, I'm not saying he does this to everybody, but he did it to Ron Adeba. He changed my life and the direction of my life in enormously. I got saved. I didn't want to serve anybody but the Lord Jesus Christ. I didn't want to work for anybody else but him. I later found out that was called a, a, called a calling to ministry. But what did I know? I just know I didn't want to be a dentist anymore. I didn't want to be part of this great movement of God. I'm not saying that's going to happen to you today, but listen, there ought to be some radical change going on in your life. I mean, radical change. By radical, I mean it's out of the norm and standards that everybody else in your, in your periphery. Everybody else thinks that what you're doing is okay, but the Bible says it's not. And you're going to go with the Bible, not with what public opinion says. What do you think of that? Huh? Have I squeezed your world a little bit? You know, go with what the world says. No, no. This whole life change comes by what God says. You follow what God says. And you've got to be a student of the Word of God. Listen, the will of God comes from the Word of God. The will of God comes from the Word of God. It doesn't come from any place else. It doesn't come from Wheaties, even though that's a breakfast of champions. It doesn't come from there. All right? Now, I want you to hold your place because I'm going to show you. I read ahead, and I'm going to tell you, my whole, my whole week last week was involved in the fourth chapter. Now, I, I encourage you, there's four chapters. Listen. Look up here. This is one little book. It's only got four chapters, 104 verses. You can read through this book every week. I expect you to read through that book between now and next Sunday. Oh, oh. I know. I didn't ask you to read the whole Bible. I mean, that'd be like war and peace, wouldn't it? I'm not asking you to read the whole Bible. But I am asking you to read the whole book. <laughs> Four dinky chapters. Come on now. Well, I do it. I don't ask of you what I don't do for myself. And I love the fourth chapter, six and seven. I love these verses. You know, you'd be surprised how many verses that are life-changing in your life that come from the book of Philippians. You'd be surprised how many verses 
out of the book of Philippians have changed your life. Here's one that changed mine. In the fourth chapter, and I spent, I spent all week ministering to people on two verses. Because I read them, I got excited about them, and God sent me people. No matter where I went, if I stopped very long, somebody asked me what kind of type of what kind of a day I was having, or they would tell me what kind of a day they were having, and then I would give them this passage. I did it all week long. All right, here's what it says. Fourth chapter, six and seven. Watch this now. Because this is what comes out of Philippians 1.4. He says, be anxious for... For what? You know what nothing means? Zero, nada, nothing, right? Be anxious for what? Oh, I know you've got something that would trump that, right? Can any trump? Can anything you come up with trump nothing? Be anxious for what? All right. Listen to what else it says. Here's the antidote. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Listen to me. I, today, or last week, on Monday, I got up, I read this. He pushed me over, and I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't get away from verse 6 and 7. And then he began to send me people. I don't care where I went. There they were, full of anxiety. You say, well, Pastor, how did you know it? Well, I looked, I looked into their eyes, and I said, is there anything I can pray about for you? You can see anxiety in people, can you not? It's full of body language. I would see that. I would say, is there anything I could pray about? They go like, oh, yeah. And they would give it to me. I say, full of anxiety? They went, yeah. I'm going to give you an absolute. I said, I'm going to tell you absolutely how to get rid of it. I mean today. I mean right now. From this day forward, anxiety will never be a part of your life ever again if you listen to me. Well, I had their attention. I had nobody didn't want to hear. Here's what I told them. But in everything, see, compared to nothing, I'm into everything now, right? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, everything. See, everything t trumps nothing. Please tell me you know that if you got nothing, now you got everything. There's been a change. <laughs> huh? If you have nothing and now you have everything, is there not a change? Yes. Thank you. I didn't write this, but I am reading it. Listen to what he says. With thanksgiving, with attitude of gratitude, an attitude of gratitude, let your request, that's prayer, be made known to Right? Be made known to God. Right? Yes. I can take you from nothing but anxiety to everything without it. Whatever, whatever you're anxious about, whatever you're anxious about is classified as what? <laughs> In this text, it's classified as nothing. I know you got a whole story to tell me. But that whole story amounts to what? I know, it, I know that your anxiety is real, and I know your problem is real, but I know that you're taking the wrong antidote for it. You're feeding it. You're just feeding it. And before you go to bed tonight, you're going to have to take all kinds of medicine so you can sleep. 
And so he gives the antidote. What's the antidote? In everything, see, everything trumps nothing. Agreed? <laughs> well, I can't explain the difference in that to you and it make any sense to you. Now watch. As a result, watch this now. Here's what you're going to get from the antidote. And the peace of God. What is going to replace anxiety of nothing? The peace of God. Because in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, you can let your request be known to God. And the peace of God. And the peace of God. You see, that's the true antidote for what? Anxiety. We're a nation of anxiety. And the pill people are making a fortune in it. This costs you nothing. You don't even have to put anything in the offering plate when it comes by. This is, this is it. This is the absolute answer. And the peace of God, which surpasses all your comprehension, that's where your mind is right now. Well, I don't see how that could possibly be. He don't know what I got going on. I don't care what your anxiety is about. It amounts to what? Thank you. See, if I could get you convinced of that, you can solve it. But what you really need is the peace of God that surpasses all, your, all, your, all the things that your mind is about. Oh, you're floating over here, and what about this, and what about that, and what about this, and what about that? You understand me, people? The peace of God which surpasses all comprehension. Don't let your mind go anywhere but the Bible. Put your, put your mind in the Bible and get the Word of God. Watch what watch you'll do. It will guard, watch this now, it will guard your heart, that's what you believe in, and your mind, that's how you think in Christ Jesus. It will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So you don't have to go back to this again and again and again and again and again. Well, if I was you, I'm not, but I have been, I would take those two verses to heart. And we could get the church out of anxiety and get them into the work of the Lord with a, with a contented heart. You can't get the church doing anything today because they're so full of anxiety. <laughs> If there's an easy fix, this is it. You don't have to go to a shrink or a pill, pill doctor. Go to the Word of God, people. Go to the Word of God. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always offering prayer. That prayer is decent and a, a prayer of specific needs. He's praying over over special needs. Somebody, you go to our prayer line, you have a special need, you go to our prayer line, you put it up there, and we all pray about it. We hit it. We get it. Watch this. Always praying with joy. That's Kara. Always praying with joy. You know why? Because I know God's going to give an answer on it. I know when I pray, I want to hit the bullseye dead center every time. Do you have that confidence? You will when you leave here. To, oh, man. Won't be today. The clock got me. Well, let me, let me do this. I'll come back next Sunday and we'll finish this. Because you, you'll have the paper and you'll be up. But let me do it. Jesus, this is a really interesting story about Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed in our Eucharist. 
He takes three disciples with him to Gethsemane for prayer. Peter, James, and John, his top three guys. He takes his top three, top three guys with him. Listen to what he says to them. He said to these guys, he, now these are his lieutenants. These are th three top guys. He says to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. I brought you out here to pray with me. Now at this point, he doesn't tell them how long. Later, he's going to tell them how long he expected them to pray and they couldn't do it. But he didn't give them a challenge up front. He wanted them to go out and pray with him. He was, his soul was deeply grieved to the point of death. I mean, I just needed you with me. I want you to be part, of, part with me in my prayer. If you read this story in Matthew 26, 36 through 50, you will find some interesting things about that. He prays, they sleep. <laughs> he, comes, he comes back and he goes like, whoa, hey guys. He goes back and prays, they go back to sleep. He comes back a third time, he says, hey guys. He goes back to prayer, they go back to so we see a pattern in their life about prayer. This was an emergency call by the top guy. Picked his top three guys. Who couldn't carry the water, let alone the ball. In this conversation with him, he tells him two things. The first thing he told him, I knew we had a, a hard, long day. I was only expecting you to pray with me an hour. He didn't tell them to start with. He told that when they couldn't do it. Oh. Well, Lord, if you told me it was only going to be an hour, we thought it was going to be one of those long night deals. If, if I'd have known it was only going to be an hour, I think I could have washed my face that long. <laughs> Every 20 minutes washed my face, I think I could have stayed up an hour. No, I wanted you to be moved by the Spirit of God. I wanted you to pray to have meaning and power. No, I left you to your will. You know the second thing he told him? He said, I hope you discovered something about yourself today that you're going to need. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. There, there was a great lesson. I speak to you today. Your spirit is willing. You know what the Bible says about your behavior. You know what the Bible says. And you wrestle with it. Jesus is saying to you today, you can't win if your spirit is willing and your flesh is weak. You've got to be able to put that flesh under the control of something that's stronger than you. And that's the Holy Spirit of God. You cannot conquer the forces that have conquered you without the power of the Holy Spirit over your flesh because your flesh is weak. That's a normal principle. And it don't have the power to do the, the will of God. 
Your prayer life will never change until you get the flesh out of the way and put the spirit in that place. Write this down, and I'm going to close. Galatians 5, 16 and 17. You walk by means of the indwelling Holy Spirit, and you will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. And he goes on later in that passage and describes what he means by the flesh. You have to walk in the spirit, not to walk in the flesh. You're going to walk in one of them. There's no neutrality, not even when you sleep. So, next week we're going to come back to this passage. And I'm going to talk to you about how to have an effective prayer life. You should be able to pray and hit the bullseye dead center every time. And the problem with the church of Jesus Christ, they don't know how to pray, therefore they pray and just throw it up hoping something will stick. We're going to, we're going to fix that. We're going to fix that for sure. So you'll have a chance to study over this and I'll explain it to you next week on Sunday. Uh, we are going to have class on Tuesday here that, I know that's the fourth, and if, if you want to come and have lunch with us, why come? We're studying the tribulation, so we're going, to weather, we're going to weather right through this thing. So that's where we are. We're going to study the end of the tribulation. So our Father, we thank you today for these that have come to study with us, to be part of the Eucharist. What a powerful little book, the book of Philippians. It's got so many key doctrines in it that are so essential to the young believer, to the young church. Key doctrines that they need to understand, like the one we introduced today about prayer. I pray, Father, that we would be attentive in the book of Philippians to grab these basic, basic, wonderful doctrines that are life changers, life changers, like anxiety. My, 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 there's no reason for a Christian to ever be anxious about anything. Be anxious about nothing. Teach us these principles, Father. Teach us these principles as a church in Moody that can have ministry to people like we did all week long with people filled with anxiety. Never heard anything like this in their life. That's a shame, Father. Let that not be us. Let us share this message with other people in Jesus' name. Amen.